This program is proudly brought to you by Fishing Industry Association PNG and Data PNG Limited. Good night, Papua New Guinea. I'm Malcolm Weirer, and welcome to another episode of In Focus. Our guest for tonight is retired Major General Jerry Singerok. We discuss his life story through his book, A Matter of Conscience, Operation Rousing Quick. General Singerok, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Malcolm. Uh, firstly, General Singerok, uh, why was it important for you to tell your story through the, your book? Thank you. It's a very important question. Um, I had a couple of reasons why I had to write the book. At the time of the Bougainville crisis, there was not enough documentation about what actually happened from the military and the government perspective. And at the height of uh, the crisis itself, I was the commander. And at that particular time, we were instructed to bring in mercenaries from Africa to participate in the actual operations with the Defence Force. And um, I, I, I was not happy for many reasons, but because of what I did, I, I was subjected for criminal charges. Um, I, I lost my job. I was prosecuted, persecuted both in court and on media. And I said, well, there's not enough information to the public about the genesis of Bougainville crisis itself, the actual handling of the, the administration and the, the peace process the, uh, of, of the, if there was any at that particular time. And of course, what what the Defence Force did, or what elements of the Defence Force did, was unheard of. Um, basically, uh, seen as disobedience, defiance to the directions by the government. And uh, this was, you could imagine, this w would be the first time that the commander of the PNGDF would have um, uh, disobeyed instructions from the government. And therefore, it was very important that um, that other than the, the media reports and what was coming out from, from the national court, it was important for me to write my book. Uh, because writing the book was uh, very important because it's, it's history. Um, first time in Papua New Guinea after Second World War, more people, tw over 20,000 people lost their lives uh, in Bougainville. And this would be the first time that uh, that we had been confronted with with a, a specific threat against uh, national security. So I had to write something because it's a reflection of my personal views as a soldier first and later on as commander, so that I, I can leave history behind. And it would be up to a reader the next generation of Papua New Guineans to appreciate, for better or worse, whether they, they like the book or not, at least I've written something. Uh, it's in black and white, so they can refer to. And the other issue is that um, it's important for future departmental heads to look at what I did. And I, I um, in my book, I quoted a very important a very famous quote by Sir Edmund Beck, uh, and I quote, all is necessary for triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. End of quote. So I was just confronted with what is evil and what is good. So I had to sacrifice my career, a very short career, in fact, I spent just less than 20, 22 years to be a general. At the age of 41, 42, I, I had to do what I did. But I got to write about it. But I'd like to believe that those who participated with me were good men. 
were good men because they understood the, the importance of what is right, what is constitutional, what is the truth. And they voluntarily followed me to execute Operation Rasim Quick. So, uh, and I, I just hope that one day, uh, Malcolm, that uh, we won't repeat the same. On a personal note, uh, what motivated you to join the military and the army uh, when you were in your younger days? Yeah, well, I, it's also a leading question. Um, I, I was born only 10 years after the Second World War. I was born in 1956. The Second World War finished about 45. And there were war relics everywhere. But not only that, but um, many of our elders were either carriers or they participated as the New Guinea Infantry Battalion or they were policemen with the colonial. And I was fascinated about these stories. And um, in fact, uh, my namesake um, was a patrol officer. Uh, up, up around um, Maprik area, and um, he he had to leave his his job to to be a pilot in the Australian Army, uh, Air Force. So, and I was named after him. So I said, well, I, I was just fascinated. So I never thought that I will join the army. I I had other other plans, but um, I joined the army instead. Yeah. Thank you, General Singerok. We now go for a quick break. Join us on the other side for more discussions. Welcome back. You're watching In Focus. We continue our discussions with General Singerok. Uh, General Singerok, you titled your book as a matter of conscience, Operation Rousing Quick. Mm -hmm. Why was this a fitting title for your book? Yeah, it took me some time to work out the title. I mean, most uh, people in the military, when they write their book, they just go straight and say operation, um, like at Entebbe, you know, uh, operations Morris Dance. Um, but um, when I finished writing, or when I was at the manuscript stage, I was just debating, I have to write, I have to find a title that's appropriate. Because Operation Rousham Quick is a, is a typical um, book of a, of a military outcome. Now my Operation Rousham Quick involves more than military. It's, it's about state, it's about society, it's about people, the environment. Uh, it's about decision making, leadership. Uh, international relations, it's about the constitution, the law, um, it's about humanity. So many people were asking me uh, this, this question, I mean, even my close friends, they said, why did you do what you did? And this is not a, a one-off question, Malcolm. I mean, I was confronted with all sorts of critiques about why I, I conducted Operation Rousham Quick, for better or worse. So there's something that keeps telling me, telling me in my heart, in my spirit, there has to be something. What is that thing? So I said, it must be my conscience. It must be my conscience. Conscience, conscience. It was a matter of conscience. So I decided, I mean, that's the catching part in um, Miami Book Show when, when, when later on we'll talk about it. But when they saw this book, the, 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 the title was outstanding. So it was my conscience. And I tried to explain the definition of conscience. Conscience is something that was, is never taught in, in seminaries, in universities. It's never taught in churches, law schools. But what is the definition of conscience? Well, conscience is, is a decision that one makes out of his own conviction or her conviction about what is right or wrong. Because that's a gift. Conscience is a gift, and only God gives that gift. 
So I decided to title my book, A Matter of Conscience. Because if I didn't do what I did, then a lot of people will lose their lives. That will be invaded by mercenaries. Uh, that our governments will continue to uh, swindle uh, money. They'll corruptly make decisions. Um, and we continue to suffer. More people are gonna die. So I said, well, my conscience drove me to what I did, other than what God wanted me to do. So <clears throat> when I won my court case in, in 2004, I was asked by MTV and um, media, you, you've just won your court case after seven years. And I said, what drove you? I said, well, it's my conscience, and it's a, I was used as a weapon from God. So it's my conscience. Uh, General Silverock, do you feel there are historical uh, misconceptions which your story through your book will clarify or inform the public better? Yes, well, uh, like every other book, there's always two sides to the story. Uh, many people have misconceived ideas about what I did. Uh, even even they, they were newspaper advertisements, big papers written, even at law school at, at UPNG, there was misconception about, uh, about what I did. Um, they said I should have just resigned and go. I should never have used uh, my privilege as, the, as a general to do what I did. But the circumstances that I was con confronted with was quite different because uh, I was convicted I was convinced that I would be the only person that would attest, put an end to this decision by engaging mercenaries. And no other uh, senior officer had seen, had anticipated the, 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 the long-term consequence other than the implications of the Constitution, which is uh, Section 200, uh, which stipulates about uh, raising an illegal army. So I basically stood on section 202 of the Constitution, which basically gives the roles and functions of the Defense Force. So I, I took that on. So um, really, history can measure us one day, whether we did the right thing or not. But um, I put it to you that if, I, if Operation Rousing Quick never took place, where would Bougainville be now? with mercenaries. All you need to do is look at Angola, Sierra Leone, many African sub-Sahara countries to see all these killing fields. I mean, we, would have, we were going that part because the, the South Africans were masters, were masters in, in, in this type of operation and uh, they were prepared to move in because there was a, a, a big segment. The MO, the motors of operandi was, was, was similar. Sandline was going to use um, attack helicopters and missiles and heavy machine guns to, to open the, the mine. So <clears throat> I think history is, is, is a very important um, aspect in our life. It's important one day for critics to basically um, wipe that, that prejudice about what I did, what I did, and read the book from face value and, and, and appreciate, if they want to. Having said that, my book is now sold globally. I mean, there are about two million people already on Amazon and Booktopia and Amazon books. I mean, we can't help that. It's, it's e-books e these days. And um, this book is, is, is selling every day in Papua New Guinea. And, and the younger generation, I mean, this book is targeted more for the generations like yourself uh, who can sit down and say, well, um, the parts of the military under General Singrock were confronted with this issue of life and death, the constitution, use of force by the military, whether it was lawful or unlawful. Uh, but having said that, I. I was charged for sedition. I didn't escape. After Operation Rasim Quick, I, I surrendered myself with my lawyer and said, arrest me, and they charged me. So I still went through that process, seven years of in and out of uh, Waigani National Court, 
eventually um, Justice late Justice Katie Davani acquitted me. He said, for saving the lives of people of Bougainville, I find you not guilty. So it's, it's a personal sacrifice. So what I'm trying to express here is that leadership is, is, a, is a commitment. It's a commitment not only to your family, but to your community, to your organization, to your country. I mean, like Lee Kuan Yew said, you got to have that iron in you. You got to have that, that guts in you to make those decisions. And I think I, at that particular time of moment, I had to make those decisions. And many times leaders must be able to make unpopular decisions for the good of, of the majority of the people. So yes, I have my critics, but overall, I mean, I guess Bougainville is where today, I mean, people are happy moving around, there's no conflict, I mean, they still have a lot of issues to address, but, but soldiers are not coming back in body bags. I mean, not only soldiers, but policemen and, and, and public servants. Thank you, General Singaro. Thank you. We now go for a quick break. Join us on the other side for more discussions. Welcome back. Still with us in the studio is General Jerry Singaro. Uh, now, General Singerok, it's been quite a busy schedule for you over the past couple of months, uh, given that your book is currently being pitched to major Hollywood studios. How did this process come about? Okay, thank you. My publishers, um, Partridge and Auto Solutions, um, uh, marketed my book in Miami Book Fair in October 2012. And amongst um, many books published that year, my book was selected. Uh, about 120 books were selected in my, it's the largest book fair in, in, in America. And my, my book was selected uh, about 140, maybe 170. And then eventually there were 70 books selected for, it's called a uh, uh, book to screen pitch. And um, when the final list came out, my book ma made it, f only 48 books were selected for the Hollywood pitch. So it's really, really privileged amongst, um, I was the only author in this part of the region, Asia Pacific, to be selected to go to Hollywood to pitch my book uh, before, I think 15 Hollywood big movie companies. Yeah, so I, I traveled in February last year. Back to PNG as a country, what is your personal opinion of the PNG USA Defense Cooperation Agreement and the Ship Riders Agreement, given your experience as a former commander? Okay. Um, firstly, we we got to understand that uh, it's a global village now, and um, we are faced with uh, with common security challenges. Um, we used to be the safe backyard of Australia, our traditional partners, Australia, New Zealand, and USA. But suddenly, the inclusion of, uh, of China comes into the, into the game. And um, uh, you can understand that um, we have now become sandwiched in this, what is called uh, geopolitics. Um, that uh, it's, it's, it's superpower contest in the region, he who secures a firm base in the region consolidates uh, mainly for security and trading purposes. So, and you can see the whole gambit of this international um, squabbling, uh, a race for, for uh, superpower presence is, is now in front of us. I mean, uh, you can see how China had come into the Pacific and not far from us is uh, they've signed security packs with, uh, with, with Solomon Islands and it's got presence in, in one or two, it's got presence in Fiji. And you understand that um, they're also interested in Papua New Guinea. Um, but having said that, uh, USA and Australia, New Zealand have always been our traditional partners. They've always been our friends, I mean, since 
colonial up until uh, post-independence up until now. So the fact that the PNG government signed a defense cooperation agreement with, uh, with USA, we've already indicated our alliance, confirmed our alliance with, with USA. Um, and I believe that the, the notion of friends to all, enemy to none, which is probably a clear shade that was relevant post-Cold War. But, I mean, you see what, uh, what Israel is doing right now in Gaza. Most of the countries who were, who were passive have now stepped up. I mean, you see now the countries, um, uh, there's a war between Ukraine and, and Russia. You see, countries who are not drawn into those geopolitics, those, uh, those wars are now uh, making their allegiance known. So maybe we don't know what's in front of us. We cannot predict. But you can already see that the forces are at, the superpowers are at work. Uh, one, uh, North Korea. North Korea is the a, is a, is a biggest threat to, to America. The <clears throat> ICBM's International Continental Ballistic Missile have striking range from North Korea to, uh, to Guam. And that's a, that's a problem. That's a big threat for, for America, you can understand. And it, it needs, they, they need to consolidate in order to hit, say, Hawaii and hit the east and west coast of, of America. So you see, it's, it's globetrotting. You, he who secures a firm base can consolidate, and hence you can see why the Americans have, have come back to, to Manus. I mean, they had Manus during Second World War, and this is my critique, and I can say it here as a, as a Papua New Guinea citizen. I mean, you were here in 1945, and you left us, left a big gap. During the Second World War, Manus was the largest logistic base for, for America. It had the refuel tanks, it had barracks, it had uh, Momoto airstrip, and it was operating out from there. They've come back again. They've come back again to consolidate their presence, and that's hence the Defense Cooperation Agreement came up. My, <clears throat> my, my concern is that America needs to de do more to us if it's serious about this defense cooperation program. For example, I challenged the U.S. government to put the first Papua New Guinean fighter pilot in the F whatever, F whatever fighter aircraft that they're flying. I'm challenging the U.S. government to put a first submariner in the submarine, nuclear submarine, if this defense cooperation is to work. Because during Second World War, our soldiers, Pacific Islands Regiment, uh, Papuan Infantry Battalion and New Guinea Infantry Battalion fought side by side with their allies. Why can't we do it now? If there's meaningful uh, uh, dialogue, if there's meaningful uh, uh, outcome of defense cooperation program, uh, because I believe that they're just using um, this defense cooperation program for, for, to consolidate their presence only. So I'm, 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 I'm suggesting that we should look, we should, we should consult with U.S. further. We should got, get more value out of a defense cooperation program in order for the population to be at ease. At the moment, we're just spectators. For example, when a U.S. fighter aircraft comes in, we all stand at Jackson Airport. Hey man, Balus belong all America, you look him all. But who's flying it? Only Americans are flying it. And sooner or later, we need to know, I mean, this is the concern that I raised uh, out of Defense Cooperation Agreement. Is Manus going to become a nuclear birthing place for the nuclear submarines, the warheads? Are they going to store the warheads in Manus? If so, what are the serious implications on national security? These are my questions. And at the moment, we have no answer because if Manus is a nuclear base, then we become soft targets from North Korea, from China, if ever they press that uh, button, a nuclear uh, 
uh, head to hit hit Manus, and that's my concern. Uh, finally, General Singerok, uh, how can the public and the readership around the country and the world at large purchase a copy of the book? Yeah, thank you. Um, at the moment, I think um, uh, about 120 copies are uh, uh, given to all the parliamentarians. Um, it's up to them to read it. Uh, but um, theodists, uh, stationery have uh, selling the books, uh, same as office works, and city pharmacy will be stocking all the branches around the country. Uh, they can get the books from there. And if you want to buy online, then you just go on on Amazon, Apple Books, eBooks, uh, Booktopia, and you can buy online, and you can read electronically. Major General Jerry Singerok, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, viewers, that ends this episode of In Focus. Do join us again next Monday on our regular time slot of 7 p.m. Till then, good night. Proudly brought to you by Fishing Industry Association ENG and Data PNG Limited. <laughs>